Welcome to another vlog video. This will be part 2 of our LoRa Gateway installation series. And if you haven't watched part 1, I will post the link in the description. In part 1, we presented and discussed the equipment selection and the various choices I had to make in terms of mounting hardware, solar panel choice, battery choice and so on. In part 2, we'll do a quick teardown of the Rack 7289 V2 gateway to check out the internals and I will show you how easy it is to configure the gateway for connecting to the Things network. And at a later date in part 3, I will discuss the rooftop uh, install procedure. There is a lot of stuff that I'm not happy with, um, stuff that you might learn from and improve on your next LoRa gateway installment. So this is our gateway in its outdoor rated enclosure. There are a lot of screws to be removed, but once all of these screws are gone, uh, we gain access to the inside and we can see a bunch of antennas and no electronics. There's also an O-ring on the outside of this um, cap. I assume the gateway is built this way with the antennas in this separate section for a few reasons. Uh, number one, antennas need a solid mounting point. Number two, antennas can benefit from a solid ground plane created by this layer of metal underneath them. And number three, this layer also acts as an EMC barrier from the rest of the electronics, minimizing interference with antenna performance. This right here must be the GPS antenna. This is angled 45 degrees to the vertical axis. And this mounting position is optimized for that vertical mounting option of the gateway. Then we have two smaller antennas and two bigger antennas. And I'm going to guess the small ones are 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi antennas and the big ones are for the LTE modem, which needs to cover various frequencies. Now, after removing yet another long set of screws, we gain access to the electronics. And I had to first disconnect a bunch of uh, tiny IPEX antenna connectors to be able to lift this lid. And now we're in. We notice uh, two PCBs in here. And on the main board, we can immediately identify a few important blocks. This is the RAC 634 Wi-Fi module, quite possibly ensuring Wi-Fi connectivity. This is the RAC 5146 LoRa concentrator module, which offers eight channels. And if you were to order the 16 channel version of the gateway, you would probably get another one of these modules populated in this free connector. This module also contains the GPS circuitry because we can see the GPS antenna input is located on this module. And before I continue with the teardown, let me mention the sponsor of this video, PCBWay.com, a professional PCB manufacturer with excellent quality and fast turnaround times. From two-layer to advanced multi-layer flex-rigid PCBs, PCBWay will have you covered. You could also try the new module stores on their website. By uh, using bonus points or cash, you can purchase a great variety of electronic modules and related tools. Check out their website linked below. This one is the RAC 8213 module. This basically contains a Quectel EG95E LTE modem. So this is for the LTE option that I have on my gateway. Uh, this space would be free if you wouldn't uh, get the LTE option for the gateway. There is another unpopulated option. It's marked uh, Rack 4289. It's a smaller module which I believe can offer BLE connectivity but I haven't seen this mentioned on the uh, datasheet of the gateway neither as an option on the product page for purchasing. This vertical module we see here is for sure in charge of the PoE power input. Uh, it does isolation plus uh, DC to DC converter to step it down to something like 12 volts. And funny enough, there is a DC jack in here which is not used uh, because we have our secondary power input module with uh, filtering and this uh, takes in uh, DC input from the external connector. And maybe this exact motherboard is used in another gateway, like an indoor version where you plug power directly into this DC jack, which is exposed uh, through uh, an enclosure cutout. On the back of the motherboard, the, there isn't anything exciting to see, just a few supporting passives. So I'm not going to go any further with this teardown. There are some EMC test reports available online in PDF format that show the back of the motherboard, so you could check those out. I'll link them in the description below. The one thing that I am very much interested to check in this teardown is their power input circuitry. I see 12 volt marked everywhere on the PCB, but let's check out the actual DC to DC converter chips they use. 
uh, see if we can identify them to check out their maximum input voltage uh, and figure out if they can withstand the 14 volts that it may experience from my lead acid battery and the inverter while it's charging it or if I need to add extra protection for that. So on this uh, separate power input PCB, we only have uh, ferrites, common mode chokes, varistors, capacitors. This looks like some sort of TVS diode, uh, but I'm sure uh, all of these parts will have a voltage rating, which is much higher than 12 volts. Uh, then the power goes onto the motherboard. There are some three amps rated Schottky diodes uh, to uh, do an OR selection of the two uh, power input options. We have this uh, very cap diode for filtering. Uh, the markings are A30B. Then we have different conversion blocks and they are labeled A, B, C, D, and E. And now blocks A and B have this chip, which is marked IAEUN. And I can't find any info on this guy. Uh, I had no luck on my Google searches, but maybe you guys can identify this. Please let me know in the comments below if you know the part number of this uh, DC to DC converter chip. Now block C has this package which, um, with markings 44T. This can either be a dual Schottky diode or an LDO rated for 4.4 volts output with an input up to 19 volts. Uh, block E has this guy with markings AACP. This could again be a low voltage LDO with an input of uh, 3.6 volts maximum. So this is clearly being fed from another step down voltage we have here and we don't have to worry about it. The big unknowns are block A and B that I think take the DC input directly and step it out to some other levels needed on the motherboard. I don't have a datasheet to confirm their maximum input voltage, but uh, typically in a design for a 12 volts input, you wouldn't go with something like, you know, a 14 volts maximum rated uh, input DC to DC converter. I don't think uh, that's even a usual rating. So you could go with uh, maybe a 15 volts rated input. Uh, those are typical numbers that you would find, but on the safe side, you'd probably go with something that has at least 17, 18, 19 volts of input rating for 12 volts input. So I think I will be good with my occasional 13.8 volts from my lead acid battery when it's full or when it's charging. Uh, this is just based on logic and on the fact that I have designed uh, circuits like these before. And now for the second part of this video, I'm going to show you how to set up this gateway to connect to the Things network. Number one, start by connecting an antenna to your gateway. Never power up the gateway without an antenna connected as that may lead to damage in the RF section. Number two, if you're using the LTE modem option, insert the SIM card. This is not hot swappable, it needs to be done before power up. And if you're using the Ethernet PoE option, connect that to your network and power that up. Alternatively, you can power it via the 12 volt uh, power input, which takes in uh, exactly 12 volt. And the datasheet specifically mentions the use of solar charges is prohibited as they may provide more than 12 volts, which may cause damage to the device. So make sure you're not supplying this with more than 12 or maybe 14 volts. Otherwise, this will void your warranty. After power is applied, you will see various LEDs blink on this little panel. And depending on the blink pattern of these LEDs, it can mean a bunch of different things, which are described in the datasheet of the product. Read the manual for those. Next, wait a minute uh, and from your computer, check for a Wi-Fi access point named Rack7289CV and some random numbers after it. Connect to this access point and to access the web management platform, input the IP address 192.168.230.1 in your web browser. Your browser will probably show a certificate error, that's normal. Uh, default username and password are root, uh, but it will first ask you to set a custom secure password. Uh, next, the setup will ask you to select a country for uh, choosing the correct frequency settings. Step number four, we need to add the gateway to the Things network. So we go to the TTN console, click on gateways, register gateway. Uh, now we need to paste the UI, which we can get from our Rack Wireless Gateway dashboard uh, or from the label of the uh, gateway. Next, we paste the EUI, give it a name, select the frequency plan, then we click register gateway. Now you should see data coming through and if that's not the case, the first thing to check is if the server address field on the Rack7289v2 dashboard is set to the correct value 
as indicated by the Things Network Console Gateway settings. And if you don't have the correct value in there, uh, just put the, the right value and save the settings. Your gateway should now be online. You should start seeing updates in the live view on the Things Network Console. And at this point, you might start to ask yourself if there is any remote management option, because if you go and install this gateway in a remote location or even on the rooftop, you don't want to be going there whenever you want to change a setting. So people used to do this by setting up a VPN service on the gateway um, because it's uh, uh, running OpenWRT under the hood. So that's possible, but there is an easier way for remote management these days. There's no need to mess around with a VPN server. And Rack Wireless started offering this WISDM management interface. And there's also a free tier, which is perfect for personal usage. And by registering for this service, it will allow you to remotely monitor and manage your Rack Wireless gateway. It even includes email notifications for various events like gateway is up, gateway is down, which are super helpful. And it only takes a couple of clicks to set up. So first, create an account with Rack Wireless if you don't already have one. Then go to uh, this URL, sign in with your Rack Wireless account, and you can optionally set up a 2FA security check on your account for an extra layer of security. Now, step number one is to set up an organization. Then within that organization, you should set up a location because we have to remember this interface is supposed to help you to manage not just one gateway, but large deployments. Hence, there is a bit of grouping happening uh, based on organizations and locations to make management a bit easier. A specific location will contain settings which will be automatically applied to all of the gateways adopted to that location. So a bit of caution here to set up the location setting correctly, things like network configuration, the work mode setup as a packet forwarder and the server address to the correct one indicated in the Things Network console. These are critical if you plan to connect to the Things Network uh, because as soon as you adopt the gateway to this location, it will automatically apply these settings and override the settings of the gateway. And if you don't have the correct values, your gateway will just disconnect from the Things Network where you previously had it set up. And don't ask me how I learned that. So step number two is to add um, uh, your gateway from the locations menu. You just click add gateway. It will ask you to input a few settings, including the gateway serial number and the EUI. And you can get those from the uh, gateway dashboard or from the label. And that's pretty much it. The process is very simple and the gateway will be discovered and adopted to your location. Uh, it will apply the settings that we've just uh, set up for the location and it should start showing as online and it will start showing stats. For example, in my case, I can see the network stats regarding the LoRa interface or regarding the LTE or Ethernet connection. If for any reason the gateway goes offline, I will get an email like this one letting me know of that event. And if someone, for example, steals your gateway, which is remotely installed and tries to reset it to factory settings, Next time it connects to the internet, it will show up in your WSDM account and it will automatically apply your settings and it will even report its GPS coordinates in the dashboard so you'll be able to locate it. So this management interface is unique to Rack Wireless products and getting all of this enterprise grade management software for free is really awesome. That alone is a good reason to purchase a Rack Wireless gateway. And I'm going to repeat myself again and again uh, through this series of videos that setting up and managing a Rack Wireless Gateway is the smoothest process that you will get, the nicest experience. I don't think any other manufacturer comes even close to this level. But if you think otherwise, please let me know in the comments below. Give me some arguments to think otherwise. And that was all for today. Thank you for joining me in this video and don't forget in the next part of the series I will show the actual physical installment of the gateway on the rooftop. I will see you next week.